I'm John Weber with AMBEST. Welcome to our webcast, State of the Cyber Insurance Market. AMBEST analysts and market experts will be reviewing a new AMBEST report that examines the growth of the cyber insurance market, which companies are most active in that line of coverage, the development of cyber modeling, and how the insurance industry is positioned to cover those risks. We're going to meet our panelists in just a moment. Now, we may mention the subject of financial strength ratings. A full explanation of AM Best ratings is available online at ambest.com forward slash terms. The opinions expressed by our panelists are theirs and theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of AM Best. If you have a question or comment, you can send it in to us at webinars at ambest.com and we're going to do our best to recognize it during our program today. And now let's meet our panelists. We have with us today Fred Aslami. Fred is an associate director here at I Am Best. Fred, good to see you. Good to, good to be here. Also with us today is Sam Hanig. Sam is a senior industry analyst at I Am Best. Sam, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Last but not least, we have with us Matt Silly. Matt is client services manager at CyberCube. Matt, welcome. Thanks for having me. And Sam, we're going to kick things off with you. How is uh, cyber insurance doing? In general, cyber insurance is doing well. Um, cyber insurance continued to be profitable in 2018 and for the first time eclipsed $2 billion in total written premium. When we look at cyber, we look at data coming from the NAIC supplement. The NAIC supplement was launched in 2015, so this is the fourth year. Cyber insurance has been around longer than that, but this is the basis for a lot of what goes into the report. What we can see uh, in 2018 compared to previous years is, is growth is continuing. It's a little bit slower than some of the previous years, but at the very top you can see premiums eclipse $2 billion for the first time. Standalone cyber insurance, which is a policy that's just cyber insurance, there's no other coverages included, continues to be the majority of written premiums, but packaged cyber insurance, which is cyber insurance included with other coverages in a policy, is still a major player. Um, so the line is, is growing. It's, it's growing a little bit slower than previous years, but this is pretty, this is a fantastic stat. It's more than doubled since 2015. The line also continues to be profitable. If we continue to look at standalone and packaged performance, we can look at loss ratios over time too. These are the uh, paid loss and DC ratio, DCC ratios for both standalone and packaged policies. And they're still pretty, pretty strong compared to some of the other property and casualty lines, uh, hovering at about 20, 23, 24 percent in, in 2018. So overall, from some of the metric standpoints, the, the industry is doing well. Um, as we're seeing growth in premiums and consistently strong loss ratio, we're also seeing growth in claims. Um, other events in 2018 continued similar to previous years. There were high profile events. There were events including breaches, leaks. Um, some municip municipalities had some, some malware exposures or malware incidents, excuse me. Among the writers of cyber insurance, we saw mostly flat movement, although AXA's acquisition of Excel Group did drive some of their change in, in top writing status. Um, the top writers of standalone uh, actually gained market share, where the writers of packaged policies actually have less market share compared to previous years. Uh, but with with advancements in the Internet of Things and big data, we're seeing increased exposures to cyber risk and the, those that would do harm with cyber attacks are, are becoming more clever and, and finding new ways to, to access companies and municipalities and data. Um, and we're also seeing increases in cyber regulation. Um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But overall, the industry is growing profitably and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how it develops. Okay. Fred, what is AM Best view on the state of the cyber insurance market? Well, <clears throat> let me give you a, a little bit of background about this uh, NAIC supplement. Uh, this was implemented, as Sam mentioned, in 2015. Um, and this is our fourth uh, report that we come up with. Um, it's only for the U.S. companies who file the supplement uh, with DNAIC uh, findings that they provide to their uh, 
uh, customers and uh, regulatories. It, uh, we, we have faced consistently with the number of issues, data issues, and we have been trying to go back to the company and correct those numbers. Having said that, two billion is what uh, the US market showed uh, uh, that they wrote on cyber. Um, this doesn't include uh, the, the international, the global market, uh, and uh, it doesn't include, uh, for example, a number of captives who do not file NAIC. So it's kind of distorted, but it gives a good indication of what the size of the market could be. And if you, uh, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that uh, international companies uh, uh, write uh, equal to even more uh, than what uh, the U.S. companies wrote. So if you assume that the uh, U.S. market, uh, uh, gl global cyber market is about five, six billion in, in premiums, compare that with the 800 billion that the commercial PC market has. So you see a lot of room for uh, cyber to penetrate to um, the areas that it need to uh, including the small to medium-sized businesses. So uh, that's what we see, and that's what this year's actually showed, that you know, the majority of the writings were towards the small to medium-sized um, companies, uh, which they have realized that you know, with the frequency and uh, uh, severity of uh, cyber attacks increasing for the past couple of years and expected to, uh, continue, um, they've realized that they need to have some kind of a cyber protection um, by uh, buying insurance. Okay. Uh, Sam, you mentioned that the line is profitable. That being the case, should we expect to see more competition? Certainly. Uh, in 2018, we saw a growth from 471 riders to 528 riders. And we would expect that to continue, but it's more than just profitability driving growth uh, in the cyber line. There's also competitive pressures. Um, what we're seeing in the marketplace is that uh, there, if there's a, a quote for some kind of business owners or, or some type of policy, and it's between a writer who offers cyber insurance and one who may not offer cyber insurance, it's the one who, who offers cyber insurance may receive favorable treatment. So it's not just loss ratios driving driving uh, increased competition and, and more, more riders in the market, but also remaining competitive for other lines. If you want to remain competitive, you need to offer cyber insurance. The other guys are. You, you don't want to be, keep be playing catch up. So are smaller riders able to offer the coverage? Fred, what are your thoughts on that? What are you saying? Well, in, th in theory, yes. Uh, small uh, companies, uh, given the fact that if they have the talent, in under, underwriting talent and, uh, you know, uh, risk assessment uh, uh, procedures that they Im Im implement, uh, they can write uh, cyber. But in practice, we see that, you know, captives in particular have uh, moved uh, towards, although it's not much, but uh, we can see that captives are well situated within the organization to uh, look at the cyber of their cyber exposure of their companies and devise ways to either accept some of those risks themselves, meaning the captives, and sell, you know, buy insurance to protect themselves in an addition to what they can, uh, what their risk tolerance is uh, in terms of the captive and the parent. So, yes, uh, the, the answer is. Yes to both questions. Small companies can write uh, uh, cyber, provided that they have the necessary talent, including the underwriting talent, uh, and again, use of uh, uh, not simply a 10 page application, but uh, use of a third party uh, risk assessor who can come in and take a look at, uh, work with your IT or CISO people, and uh, decide you know where the potential failures might be vulnerabilities might be and then recommend uh, coverage for those areas that uh, need to be covered by insurance 
Now, Matt, let's bring you into the conversation. The report shows that loss ratios are low. Are premiums sufficient, however, in the event of a, a cyber cat event? That's a, that's a great question, and, and I'll kind of give you my, my personal view on that. Um, uh, the honest answer is it's incredibly uncertain. Um, uh, my, my gut is that uh, there is a, a severe risk that premiums probably aren't adequate. Um, to kind of cover those those tail end um, type of events uh, that, that are possible um, at, at Cybercube, we're we're trying to test that, and and I think we're feeling the brunt of the fact that this is a um, a kind of a new type of risk where we're actually what what insurance companies are interested in getting their their arms around um, is the types of scenarios that just haven't occurred yet. Um, we see with property models when a you know um, Hurricane Harvey hits, um, uh, the, the the kind of model vendors can come out with with different loss estimates that can span um, quite a large range, um, and that's even post an event has even occurred. Um, and what we're trying to do, um, not just at Cybercube, but but as a as a wider industry, is is really get our arms around what are the types of aggregation event um, that that could happen, um, uh, and how could that filter through to to insurable loss. Um, I think the strength of uh, a vendor um, uh, is, that, is that kind of any model is, is a realization of, um, uh, uh, of a kind of a wealth of expertise, whether that be um, threat intelligence uh, uh, officers, um, risk modelers, um, you know, actuaries that kind of understand how these models are used. Um, and, and, and these models kind of bring together um, all of that, that expertise. Um, Linking back to the, the original question um, of, of are premiums uh, kind of adequate for these types of events, um, as we look to build out these scenarios uh, and, and model what the loss estimates could be for specific portfolios, um, my, my personal view um, is, is that, that people who aren't um, at least trying to get their arms around this and, and, and really um, understand what they're exposed to um, um, might struggle. So are we seeing underpricing in the line, particularly in the way of new market entrants? Uh, Sam, what are you seeing? Is that, and is it a concern if we are? Um, I don't know if we're necessarily seeing underpricing from new entrants. It is a concern of ours. What we are seeing is new entrants primarily write uh, the packaged policies. The packaged policies might have lower sublimits. Uh, but kind of building off what Matt was saying, I would think you know our, our, some of our biggest concerns are the systematic events, a shock loss event. You know, we've not. We've not seen a cyber cat event. Um, so even though you know underpricing is a concern and we would prefer a, a healthy cyber insurance industry uh, on the whole, uh, it's really the cat events that are probably our, our biggest concern when it comes to cyber insurance. What would a cat event look like? That's a good question. We, I don't know if we know what, the, what a cat event would look like. It would probably in, impact several companies. Uh, we did a <clears throat> study about a year ago on uh, the Dyn attack, which happened in October 2016. Dyn attack was unique because uh, it happened in three stages, in three two-hour stages. And it didn't cause the insurance to um, come in and pay for the losses. In that attack, you know, at least 70 companies big from Amazon to Zillow uh, were attacked and their business interrupt. The business was interrupted, and uh, so if that event uh, had a 12-hour or 24-hour uh, consistent uh, disruption to these 70 companies, that could have been a, a tsunami for for the industry. But luckily, as I said, you know, it happened in uh, uh, three events. Uh, Losses were relatively minor, in interruptions were relatively minor, and it didn't reach to a level of uh, um, a cyber uh, catastrophe. But uh, uh, companies, you know, like Aon, um, Science, uh, Cybercube, they have done studies and uh, they look at the economic loss on the one hand, what happens if, for example, a dam breaks down or uh, some other uh, catastrophic uh, event happens, and uh, uh, they estimate uh, the insured losses, which usually ranges from six to seven, eight percent, um, which is huge. But again, in our opinion, uh, which we reflected uh, about a year ago in a 
report that we produced uh, um, uh, increasing the uh, uh, you know the premium of uh, projecting the premium of um, cyber for 2020 and as well as projecting the surplus of those top 20 companies we didn't find any of the um, aggregations on the two scenarios that we ran to be more than what uh, hurricane or earthquake uh, PMLs would be. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it is big, uh, it's in billions, but uh, it, it's not as much as uh, her, uh, natural catastrophe uh, uh, stress that we make onto our car. All right, Fred, Fred, can you talk about what cyber policies are enforced by type? Um, well, again, first, anecdotally, uh, we hear that uh, uh, the language on cyber policies are being improved and changed. Um, uh, typically, uh, we see two, two types, uh, you know, standalone and packaged. Uh, standalone, uh, uh, since uh, we saw the increase in the standalone, we thought uh, this could help pricing, this could help uh, reserving, this could help modelers, because everything is defined, all the exclusions are put aside, everything uh, uh, nicely in a, in a uh, package, you know, pun intended, you know, with the other package. So everything is defined. So for a modeler like CyberCube, I think if they look at a um, standalone cyber policy, they can easier, it would be easier for them to model that rather than go and, uh, you know, uh, do the modeling on the packaged. Uh, I welcome uh, Matt to, um, you know, interject if he has any uh, opposition or uh, disagreement. Yeah, I, I I think I think one of the biggest challenges with um, with kind of modeling packages is really understanding what coverage is is kind of written in there. Um, so I, I suppose that once you've once you've developed um, a model and a, and a framework um, to kind of work on, um, you you can have a, a completely perfect model that is uh, that, that models um, perfectly. You know what's going to happen over the next year, but if the exposure information, if the coverage isn't understood on the front end, um, uh, then then the model is meaningless. Um, so, so how we think about it at, at CyberCube is, is to kind of build that structure um, and then push that back onto you know, our clients and, and we sit down with them and, and explain our thought process um, uh, and, and really um, uh, help them walk through how to understand um, the coverage. Uh, but, but they need to have an understanding of, of what types of um, economic losses are, are covered by the coverages that are offered within, um, uh, within the package policies. Uh, and, and once you have that, actually, um, the, the losses that can arise from a, uh, a cyber attack, so whether it's a you know, ransomware attack um, or, you know, or other such attacks, um, uh, understanding how the policy terms and conditions for a package policy uh, kind of respond is, is just a case of applying the right terms and conditions to, um, to the economic um, losses. So, so I think our view is, is actually as long as the as long as the exposure information um, you know, is, is understood um, by by a carrier, um, then then it is it's relatively straightforward to kind of model um, uh, the the accumulation of losses to those policies. As a modeler, you don't have any preference uh, over a standalone or package policy, right? Um, no. No, I suppose that the other thing is, you know, with a, with a package policy, there are going to be other um, there are other types of losses that have got nothing to do with cyber um, that, that that policy might respond to. Um, but as a as a cyber modelling firm, what we are trying to do, and particularly on the aggregation space, uh, it, is really help companies to understand how their losses um, uh, to these big systemic cyber cat events um, are going to kind of proliferate through their through their portfolio, regardless of whether or not it's a standalone cyber policy, um, a, a package policy that includes affirmative cyber, um, or you know whether it's a a property policy that might have um, kind of a, 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 a coverage which which would respond to you know data loss, for example. Matt, with regard to uh, aggregation of cyber risk, how should companies be managing this? 
Um, I, I think um, they should be managing it in the way they in the way they see fit, um, and, and I think it's really important that, that individual companies kind of have their own view of risk, um, understand uh, their risk, match that up to their kind of risk appetite, uh, and can kind of articulate that um, to their to their board, their shareholders, um, how they are uh, how they're managing that. Um, from a cybercube point of view, uh, we think that the way that these uh, types of events are going to um, uh, become systemic is through um, technology providers. Uh, so, so we we like to think of you know an event, say a cloud outage um, happening, um, and that's going to be to a specific cloud provider, so Amazon Web Service. And th then what you really need to understand uh, is is kind of who in your portfolio and um, who is exposed to Amazon Web Service. Um, the next step beyond just who's exposed to them is kind of how do they use them. So. Is it a business critical uh, uh, kind of function um, that, that is relying on that service provided by um, uh, their cloud provider? Uh, or is it something where actually, you know, if it goes down, it's just an internal HR system uh, and that's not going to drive any business interruption costs? Um, so that's where we're going. We think, you know, understanding those technological dependencies and being able to manage by that um, is kind of the future state of where we want to get to. Um, but obviously, there are there are limitations in, in that data. So like I said, you know, understanding with with 100% certainty uh, who relies on on which provider and, and kind of why they uh, use it is, is highly uncertain. Um, so while, while we're trying to find out more information um, and whether or not that's companies like, like Cybercube that, that can get that information um, and, and provide that to the insurance industry, or where we get to a point where actually on an underwriting form, um, those are the types of questions that need to be asked, you know, which service providers are, uh, are kind of um, critical for your business. Um, whilst we're kind of getting to there, um, uh, there are kind of other ways to think about how you can manage, uh, and, and we call it a micro segment uh, at, at Cybercube, um, industry, uh, company size, and, and geography. Um, and you can start to look at your aggregation risk by by those kind of micro segments, um, uh, thinking through that you know similar types of companies are, are potentially going to be exposed to similar types of of service providers. Sam, what types of claims are being filed by cyber policy holders and, and why isn't there just one type of claim? Yeah, we, we do our analysis based off the NEIC annual statement and the NEIC annual statement breaks down claims into a couple of categories. So we've already talked about the difference between a standalone and a packaged policy, but we also have uh, claims in terms of first party and third party uh, policies. And, and these are a little bit less intuitive. So first party policies, more straightforward. Let's say you're a, a company, you're a retailer, you want to protect yourself, you want to protect your, your customer's data from some kind of cyber event. Should a cyber event occur, you purchase first party uh, cyber insurance. So if you have first party cyber insurance, this protects you. But uh, third party insurance is not as simple. So let's say you hire an IT vendor to come into your office to, to implement some software, maybe it's payroll software. They come in, they do something, they do their job, they implement some kind of IT software, they go away. Uh, if there is some kind of cyber event and it is determined that the, the vendor that you've hired is responsible for the cyber event, third party protection is for the vendor. So it's sort of like Instead of completed operations insurance, it's more like secure operations insurance. We came, we performed a service, and that, that, that service is secure. And for some reason, unintentionally, our service was, the responsibility, was, was responsible for some kind of cyber event that would be third-party insurance. So we can see um, some of the trends here. So this is what we're seeing in the actual filed claims. Uh, on the right is the uh, 2018, the most recent year. The top two bars are going to be for first party insurance. So unsurprisingly, most companies require uh, cyber insurance or should have cyber insurance. So we are seeing the majority of claims coming from first party. Uh, and we are seeing fewer claims coming from third party. So that's a little bit about what we would expect to see. And as the industry grows in terms of premium and policies, so we are seeing a growth in claims. Okay, now Matt, we've seen rapid growth in cyber insurance over the past several years. Um, what does CyberCube see as the biggest risks facing the industry? So I think it will, it will come as no surprise, uh, John, that my my view um, uh, is kind of the the aggregation risk. Um, so you know, I've been speaking to uh, kind of reinsurers around the around the market. 
Um, and and uh, there's a couple of things, you know, that, that they're uncertain about. And, and one, um, and it kind of um, uh, points to Sam's point about coverage, um, you know, different companies are offering different coverages uh, within kind of the, the primary policies. So getting your hands around that is, is, a, is a concern for the, for the market. Um, but also then um, from a reinsurance standpoint, uh, you know, um, understanding that aggregation risk as well. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of primary insurers uh, are seeding quite a lot of um, uh, kind of their, their um, portfolios out, um, and that that um, you know, by definition means that a lot of that aggregation risk might be might be sitting within um, uh, the reinsurance market. Um, you, know, uh, you, you asked a question earlier about what does a what does a cyber um, kind of cat event look like, uh, and and that's exactly what we're trying to grapple with. Um, it, it is highly uncertain, um, and we are kind of trying to test. You know what, what's possible um, uh, out there. You know, and, and we're trying to put frequencies um, and, and severities to to kind of events um, that that we just don't have any historical precedents. Um, which, for an actuary, um, is is quite a, a a tricky thing to do. You know, the insurance industry is built on on thinking about um, you know, what's happened in the past, learning from from that claims experience, trending it. Um, and, and when we really haven't seen these types of events before, that that can be a real challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, Fred mentioned the the dinner attack. Another couple that that kind of big warning signs that will be very familiar to people are kind of wanna cry and and, and not petcha, which happened a, a few years back. And there were many reasons why um, they didn't spread more uh, more widely. Um, uh, and you know, it was it came through a a, a vulnerability that was actually already known. Um, so, so what happens if you know a cyber attack comes through um, a zero day vulnerability? That's a vulnerability that just isn't known. There's no patch for. Um, uh, people don't understand. Um, you know that response time uh, might take uh, significantly more time. So you might end up with material amounts more business interruption. Um, uh, so understanding that aggregation risk, um, uh, I think I, I see um, personally, and, and at CyberCube we see that as a as a real risk to the industry. Um, I would. I, I personally think you know we see the growth in the market in terms of uh, in terms of rate income, um, and uh, I, you know I think if if you're um, if you if you've got processes in place to um, to to kind of manage that, um, uh, and I think a big part of it is education. It's it's understanding you know what the threat landscape looks like, um, uh, and and that means having you know real um, deep insight into security and um, information security so you need access to those kinds of people um, uh, within your team to, to help you understand this aggregation risk and, uh, and i think if you're if you're not doing that um, and you're you're just growing um, uh, you're, you're putting yourself at real risk i would like to uh just to add uh, <clears throat> to what matt said uh, the uh, the fact that you know these em uh, emerging risks uh, like, for example, uh, attacking on municipalities with ransomware. These are the type of uh, um, attacks that, you know, we need to understand more and we need to be able to prevent more. Um, so far, 200, almost 200 municipalities in the state have been attacked with ransomware, uh, Baltimore and Atlanta being uh, the top ones. Um, uh, and the demand is Bitcoin. You know, pay us Bitcoin, you get your uh, system back. But uh, imagine that um, uh, there is a multiple attack on multiple cities at the same time. And uh, the purpose is not anymore, you know, getting Bitcoins, you know, just, dis you know, disrupting the cities. Police doesn't pay, doesn't get paid, uh, you know, utility people, same employees don't pay don't get paid so that's a big uh, havoc it creates a big havoc for the whole city or for the whole part of the country so those are the type of things that you know we should be able to uh, model in a way um, and unfortunately on on ransomware uh, there hasn't been much effort to come up with modeling uh, uh, features um, to see how that can impact, um, you know, at least a portion of the country or, you know, uh, the whole, the entire country. All right. Thanks, Fred. Yep.
Uh, we'd like to remind viewers that if they have a question for our panelists, they can send it in to us at webinars at ambest.com, and we're going to do our best to recognize it during our program here today. Uh, Fred, how are reinsurers viewing the cyber market? Okay. Well, uh, primary insurers, the ones who provide the cyber risk, cyber insurance, they like to um, be with the policyholder. In other words, they want to um, see what vulnerabilities they have, what capabilities they have, um, and uh, make the risk assessment evaluation and then issue their policies. Now, uh, unfortunately, from the reinsurance perspective, we don't have a clear uh, window to see what happens. And there is also uh, reluctance uh, to some extent, at least up to a few years ago, for these reinsurance companies to take a big chunk of uh, uh, cyber policy into their books. But uh, anecdotally, again, we have heard that at least on the $2 billion that uh, 2018 uh, uh, produced in terms of premium, $800 million, um, could have been reinsured by uh, uh, outside uh, reinsurers. So the market is there. It's not uh, comfortable yet because uh, uh, they're following the fortune, <clears throat> as so to speak. Um, had they been able to have face-to-face, -face, uh, or not in, in literal terms, but you know, have had the proximity to the insured, uh, there may have been more uh, uh, interest in, in reinsurers getting involved in cyber insurance. Do we know who the top writers of cyber insurance are? Sam, can you t address that? I do. So uh, these are based on uh, packaged and standalone uh, combined, uh, the top writers of cyber insurance. Uh, Chubb is the top writer, uh, followed by AXA, AIG, Travelers, and Beasley. Um, of these writers, some of them are more specialized in, in one, one category than the other. So for example, uh, let's see my notes here, uh, Chubb, Hartford, Argo, and Cincinnati uh, write 90% or more as packaged, where uh, AXA, AIG, Beasley, and Zurich are, are companies that uh, write most of their direct premium written as, as standalone policies. Uh, interesting that um, the top 10 cyber writers gained in market share, increasing to uh, almost 70% in 2018 from 68% in 2017. When it comes to policies in force, here it is. Uh, when it comes to policies in force, uh, Hartford is uh, more than double uh, the next largest writer, Liberty followed by Farmers, Cincinnati, and, and Berkshire Hathaway follow, filling out the top five uh, for writers of uh, cyber insurance. Uh, for the standalone product, for the standalone product, uh, for the standalone product, AXA, following their, their acquisition of Excel Group, is in the top slot for standalone premium writing, uh, followed by AIG, Travelers, Beasley, and Zurich. Um, and the top writers of standalone increased to market share in 2018 compared to, to 2017. And when we look at packaged writers, the top writers are, are Chubb, and they're uh, much greater than CNA, Axis, Hartford, and Allianz when it comes to the writers of, of packaged cyber insurance. Fred, what are some of the emerging cyber exposures? As I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the, the recent attacks on uh, municipalities in uh, Atlanta and Baltimore being the top one is, is a concern, is a recent uh, um, attack, recent type of attack. Uh, the whole ransomware is uh, gaining uh, sophistication and, uh, you know, so those are the areas that uh, are at least my concern because, you know, if, if they attack uh, multiple cities with ransomwares, that, uh, that will probably 
stop the operation of those cities. Um, the other uh, category that uh, is concerning is uh, nation state uh, uh, activity that you know we have seen recently in the news that Russia has uh, bugs in our uh, grid and the U.S. has similar. So those are scary and those are, you know, I'm not sure even um, insurable, but uh, those are the, the unfortunate trends that we see in the, in the market. Okay. Uh, Sam, as TRIPRA uh, approaches expiration, how could this possibly impact cyber writers? So TRIPRA, or the Terrorism Risk Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, is, is set to expire at the end of next year. Um, this is relevant to cyber insurers uh, because in, in 2013, the U.S. Treasury published guidance stating that cyber attacks could be considered acts of terrorism. So if, if TRIPRA expires, this kind of federal backstop may not be available to insurers. Uh, so we're, we're going to monitor if, if uh, some of the companies, if the companies we rate have any kind of contingency plans in place should this federal backstop not be available. Where should we look for growth in the cyber market, Fred? Yes. Definitely, I think um, SMEs are the good target, uh, and uh, they are getting sophisticated. They are uh, uh, listening to webinars like this and others. Uh, they attend similar conferences, and uh, because you know the big companies already have, they know what risk they have. They have protected themselves to the extent that they can. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that you know they can't be hacked or you know uh, attacked. But uh, for the most part, I think uh, SMEs are uh, the uh, companies or the target should be the target of cyber insurance uh, in order to protect themselves. Okay, thank you, Fred. Yeah. Matt, let's bring you back into the conversation. Is there an end state for cyber risk models, and if so, are we close? Is there an end state? Um, I, I think that that question is probably applicable to to all models, um, and and I think the simple answer is um, no. The, there's probably not an end state. Um, uh, you know, Frank, uh, uh, um, uh, Fred there has uh, sorry, Fred. Um, Fred's kind of uh, highlighted a couple of uncertainties. You know, he talked about um, nation state actors and and kind of you know. Uh, uh, the, the frequency upon which they're kind of um, committing these attacks, um, you know, they they have uh, incredible um, uh, resources at their hands and uh, and skill sets to do this. But but is there a need for them to do that? Um, and, and as the geopolitical landscape changes, um, kind of what what does that mean? Um, there's also a question over, you know, if it's a nation state, is it an act of war? Um, is it then insurable? So there are many different uncertainties um, surrounding uh, kind of. Um, you know, cyber modeling in particular, but just generally modeling. Um, so my argument would be that, you know, actually um, there, there probably is never an end state for a model. Um, models are, are by design um, supposed to be realizations of, of a group of assumptions and methodologies that help you understand the, the uncertainty inherent in, in, what, you're, in what you're writing. Um, I think, uh, f for me, uh, in, in cyber modeling, we, we do have um, quite a long way to go in terms of educating uh, the industry in, in, in what they mean um, and how they can be used. So rather than kind of saying, you know, um, is, is there an end state, it, it, it's more kind of, you know, what's the, what's the next step um, uh, in, in kind of adopting these models as, as best practice? Um, you know, NatCat modeling in particular has, has proved that um, there is a space within the insurance modeling ecosystem, uh, or sorry, in the insurance ecosystem for, for models um, to, to kind of help us understand and articulate risk better. Um, and I think the next step for cyber models uh, uh, specifically um, is to kind of uh, get them up to the standard um, such that they are kind of accepted um, by the industry uh, and can kind of uh, help to give people comfort to, to grow. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, or you asked the question there about, you know, how do we, or, or where are the next areas to grow? Um, and I think, as you know, as a, as a modelling firm, um, actually we believe that by by having more certainty uh, around um, uh, the different risks, um, so um, in particular uh, aggregation risk, um, can help. Uh, not just, um, I suppose it helps carriers uh, to kind of um, give more capacity. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking end state. I've said it's not not quite an end state, but but the next is uh, the next stage is kind of a capital markets. Um, and actually, you might find that if if we can get the capital markets comfortable with with kind of modelling, um, that, that they're more interested to provide capacity, and that can filter down. So it's not just you know more SMEs being aware of of cyber policies and, and how cyber policies respond, um, but it might give uh, it might give the larger institutions the ability to be purchasing you know bigger limits, bigger individual towers for themselves, um, uh, which kind of. Uh, tallies up um, more directly to kind of the economic losses that, that they're potentially exposed to. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Sam, are we seeing any trends in cyber regulation? Sure. As, as it becomes more public knowledge that sometimes a, a company will share data without their customer's permission to, to other entities, this is kind of raising red flags with, with customers. Um, and so, you know, correspondingly, we see we're seeing an increase in regulation to protect customers against these kinds of uh, data transfers, as as well as uh, event against data hacks, so uh, or, or cyber events. Um, one of the biggest recent uh, trends in cyber regulation comes from Europe, where there was the uh, General Data Protection and Regulation, or GDPR, was implemented in 2018. Now. It's a, it's a European regulation, but it applies to any company that does operations in Europe. So there's going to be a lot of U.S. companies this applies to. Um, and what GDPR does, among many things, is it gives kind of control of the data back to the original customer. So if, if a company wants to transfer data to a third party, they need explicit permission from the customers themselves. And, and violations of, of GDPR can actually lead to significant fines, um, up to 20 million euros or about 22 uh, million U.S. dollars, and uh, if a breach is detected, companies have up to 72 hours to notice, to, to notify, um, to notify regulatory authorities and their customers that there's been some kind of cyber event. Uh, additionally, we're seeing uh, new cyber regulation stateside in California, in particular. Uh, in 2018, the California Consumer Privacy Act was passed, and is going to be implemented in 2020. And this applies to California residents whose uh, personally identifiable information uh, is going to be additionally protected. There's going to be a bill of rights covering uh, consumers' information, and it's going to have uh, stricter requirements for security and privacy requirements. Um, this lets California residents know uh, what data is collected um, and when personal data is sold and disclosed to whom and some other requirements and applies to, to most companies operating in, in California. All right. Let's get to uh, some viewer questions, and we have a lot of them. Uh, is AM Best either in conjunction with other companies or on their own working with any regulatory bodies or government entities to standardize cyber form language in the marketplace? Fred, can you address that? Uh, not officially, uh, but we try to uh, have a, a mutual communication, uh, you know, by producing all these reports and uh, expressing our views in these reports. Uh, we are hoping that regulators will look at them and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so to speak, you know, uh, learn the lessons uh, or learn the recommendations. Um, at the same time, we are following up on uh, all these uh, regulations. As uh, Sam mentioned, GDBR, you know, we, are, uh, we have put out the paper at the time this became effective. Uh, we did the same thing with the New York State uh, uh, 500, uh, uh, DFS 500, and to educate our uh, clients. Uh, so we continue doing that. At the same time, we would uh, attend uh, conferences which have a regulatory section in terms of presentations and panels, and then Q&A will ensue uh, during those meetings. And hopefully, you know, feedback uh, is taken and uh, uh, laws and regulations are improved, yes. Okay. Another question. Are there any coverages on the horizon that are currently not included in cyber insurance that AM best believes will become commonplace in the marketplace? That is a tough one, Matt. <laughs> pushing it to me. <laughs> You're pushing it to me, Fred. Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of coverages, uh, I, I'm not. I'm not so sure. I think where we might start to see changes uh, is things like, you know, aut autonomous vehicles. It, it's it's talked about a lot. You know, how they're going to um, uh, be insured. 
um, uh, what, what kind of an aggregation risk is um, in terms of a cyber event on, on an autonomous car. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, what, what we at CyberCube are trying to do is, is think through those types of events that, that are kind of relevant for the insurance industry um, uh, today. Uh, and, and obviously, that's not something that, you know, over the next year is, is going to be a big issue. Um, but I think, you know, as, as technology changes, um, uh, you know, cyber insurance and uh, to be honest with you, you know, all, all types of insurance are going to have to adapt to uh, uh, and respond to the way technology changes. Um, so, you know, we might see new coverages which which do respond to uh, certain you know, technologies that, that are used or, you know, the ways that losses kind of um, uh, come out of those. Uh, but, but at the minute, I, I wouldn't say it's clear cut um, uh, what those might be. Matt, question specifically for you. Are you aware of any modeling being done on ransomware aggregation? Uh, yeah, so um, that was a that was a point that Fred made earlier in terms of he wasn't sure and and yeah so um, uh, at Cybercube we have a we have a suite of twenty three um, different scenarios that we're modelling against um, and, uh, and and they are supposed to represent different types of of scenario class um, you know we've got a team of of, of experts that that have an understanding of of the threat landscape so what we're trying to do is is really capture. Um, uh, the, the types of events um, that, that might be uh, kind of uh, kind of most most active over the next year or so um, and, and most relevant to the insurance industry. So within our suite at the minute, we do have a couple of scenarios that, that are supposed to represent um, ransomware type attacks. Um, and, uh, and, and as kind of we we uh, monitor and, and understand better the landscape and, and the changing trends of the insurance industry, we're kind of thinking about um, uh, the types of scenarios uh, uh, that we can add to our, our, um, uh, our log of, of, of scenarios. Uh, so, you know, one, one we're thinking about at the minute is kind of how would a ransomware uh, impact um, SME uh, businesses. Um, so what type of software are, are kind of, uh, you know, SMEs more likely to use um, and, and a ransomware attack on one of those software providers, can that have a catastrophic impact on, on a portfolio of SMEs? And, and that's responding to, you know, the, the trend in terms of threat landscape. So understanding that um, uh, uh, ransomware is becoming more prevalent um, uh, and also the trend in, in policies being taken out by, by SMEs. All right. A viewer asks, will more robust information applications such as AICPA attestations be incorporated into the cyber underwriting process? If not, why not? I think that uh, that's a question that uh, insurance companies uh, have to answer. I think it, it, it's wise to include those questions and in attestations uh, because um, if if there is a um, you know um, issue of fraud or you know then uh, you will have problems. I would. Okay, a viewer asks: Is there sufficient capacity to meet the limit requirements of large insureds? I think uh, the market again, from what we have heard from um, a number of brokers, uh, have been able to. Uh, increase the limits that they provide to companies to a billion. Um, this is the highest I've heard, uh, but uh, that means, uh, you know, yes, there is capacity available, uh, but um, I haven't seen anything, uh, again, anecdotally larger than one billion All right. for large companies. Another viewer asks, what are the typical limits the panelists have been seeing being offered for the packaged cyber coverage? Would anyone like to address that? Packaged uh, policies are typically low, you know, anywhere from 20,000, to be honest with you, to maybe half a, half a million. Uh, that's what we have seen. There may be uh, uh, larger limits that they provide uh, as part of the package the, or endorsements, but uh, you know, they're typically low. They're not in millions uh, that I have not seen. I, I haven't seen anything in multi-million uh, limits for package. Uh, All right. uh, Sam, I know you talked about growth earlier. Uh, viewer asked the question, do we have any idea of the potential for this line of business? 
certainly much larger than it is right now. We don't uh, know concretely what some of the take-up rates are. Um, you know, lots of the larger companies do have cyber insurance right now, but the, the small to medium enterprises, the SMEs, that's certainly an area of growth for the future. Uh, possibly, you know, additional coverages or, or risks might uh, increase premium growth. Uh, I, I don't have a specific number for you, but uh, take-up rates, I think I've seen some measurements uh, of being of only 40%. So if only 40% of SMEs are are acquiring cyber insurance, and that, that's 60% uh, still you know, available to make this purchase and protect themselves. All right. Um, Matt, the report outlines trends in the cyber insurance market. What pr trends uh, does CyberCube think are important, and how do these filter into your modeling? Yeah, so um, I, I think I kind of touched on that a little bit in, in my last response. And, and what we're trying to do is, is build a team of people that, that are kind of on, uh, on top of the trends in the threat landscape. Um, so really understanding, you know, what, what threat actors are doing out there, um, what tools they have available um, and how they're looking to kind of um, uh, um, make some financial gain out of, uh, out of these kind of attacks. Um, and, and by kind of having that expertise uh, in-house in and, and kind of developing our relationship with, uh, with Symantec as well, um, uh, we can start to build those into kind of our, um, our modeled scenarios um, uh, to make sure that kind of we're giving that insight into, uh, into kind of how those, uh, how the threat landscape uh, and, the, and the trends in that threat landscape are kind of playing out uh, in terms of modeled loss. Well, we are quickly approaching the end of our webinar here today. It's been a very informative presentation by our panelists. And this is the part of the webinar where we would like to circle the panel and get our closing thoughts from each of you. And Matt Silly, why don't we start with you? What's, what do you think is the key takeaway here in today's presentation? I think um, for me, uh, it, it's a, it's an exciting place to work at the minute. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of change in cyber. Um, there's there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and just um, having that uncertainty um, uh, it makes it kind of you know an ex exciting place to to work um, and, a, and a challenging place to work as well. Um, I think you know we're talking um, the report talks about trends and we're seeing um, an uptick in in premiums we're seeing an uptick in claims um, we're seeing an uptick in in policies and force um, uh, and i think that, that that will continue to um uh, to go in that direction for the seeable future um you know, we talked about capacity um, uh, and what whether or not there is enough capacity, whether there'll be more capacity. And, and for me, um, I think the investment that, that carriers, both primary and, and reinsurers, uh, are, are putting in, in kind of understanding this risk better and, and really grappling this risk um, just shows that, that there is an appetite to, um, to offer more insurance um, uh, in, in kind of a managed way. Um, and I, I kind of talked about the ILS market um, a, a little bit earlier, um, you know, in discussions that, that are going on um, around the market, you know, there is an appetite there to provide capacity. Um, and, and for me, it's uh, it's only a, um, a matter of time before before they can get comfortable. Um, they can provide more capacity, um, uh, and we'll see this this grow um, even more. Um, my overarching caveat on all of that is that we really need to do this in a responsible way um, and uh, an understanding um, the, the risks inherent in that, uh, understanding from an individual risk point of view um, what, what drives um, a, a kind of a bad security risk. Um, uh, we need to do that. We also need to pair that with an understanding of, of aggregation risk um, and, and really manage um, the growth in a, in a kind of a responsible and, and sustainable way. All right, thank you, Matt. Sam Hennig, what do you see as the big takeaway here today? Cyber insurance is still new. We're still refining how we underwrite, how we price, how we model, uh, how we adapt to advances in technology. And I'm excited to see where the industry goes. There's new access points and, and how, how the industry can help protect society in terms of protections and get people back on their feet or companies back on their feet uh, when these cyber events occur. Okay, thank you, Sam. Fred Islami, you get the last word today. What's, uh, what's the key takeaway? Yeah, well, I mean, market uh, definitely has the potential to grow. Um, I think uh, comp as, as this exposure or, uh, grows, companies have to be able to come up with their maximum 
potential exposure or PML. And by that, I mean companies like CyberCube or RMS or AIR or Science can help these companies exactly the same way that 20, 25 years ago we used uh, those similar companies to come up with uh, PMLs on earthquakes, hurricanes, um, etc. So it, it behooves on the industry to, to work together, uh, not only in terms of coverage uh, of the small to medium sized businesses by for insurance, for cyber insurance, but also partner with uh, uh, modeling companies to see exactly what they have in terms of exposure so that they can share that information with us so we can see if uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, any, any re rating impact on those companies. Uh, we haven't formalized our uh, um, uh, cyber uh, so to speak, PML, uh, we, we don't have a uh, criteria for that yet, but it's being worked on maybe next year or the following year. As the market uh, gets mature, we can, we can publish that criteria, hopefully uh, get comments on it and start implementing it uh, similar to, again, uh, earthquake and hurricane into our uh, stress uh, mode uh, the car uh, calculation. Okay, thank you, Fred. Thank you, panelists, one and all, for an outstanding presentation here today. Um, if you would like to see the report, it is available online at ambest.com. Now, we will have a full replay of this webinar posted within the next day or so. Uh, transcript will be out within the next couple of weeks. For AM Best, I'm John Weber.